Hi folks, welcome to another section on diluted earnings per share. We've already finished the first uh, note on diluted earnings per share, which was basically an introduction and gave you an example with options. In that introduction, we talked a little bit about what diluted earnings per share was, how you know if a security should be included in your dilutive, e diluted EPS calculation, some examples of securities that may be dilutive, and how to prepare a cascade worksheet in order to calculate your uh, diluted EPS. Um, so because we've already done an example with options, I thought I would go through a question with you that now included another security, a convertible bond. So we're now going to combine convertible bonds as well as options into one problem and again we're assuming that there were no conversions during the year so in other words no options were actually exercised to issue common shares and no bonds were actually converted during the year in order to produce any new shares so let's begin and have a look at the problem. Now again, you you know, as I've often said, you should probably think about printing this document so you can follow the problem, um, and it is in your course. So now, uh, again, we're going to look at the what if scenario. So there is no uh, no conversion at this time, but we just want to make sure that we can do a question that has more than one security in it. So here we've got a company, Wilcox. They have to disclose their EPS information in their statements uh, at the end of this particular year. And then they start to tell you uh, throughout 2006 what their situation was in terms of common shares. And here we find they have 450,000 common. They were issued for 5.75 million. They have an authorization limit of a million. And we also know that at the beginning of Act 6, there were 50,000 cumulative preferred shares outstanding, and each of those preferred shares paid a $5 per share dividend over the year. And they got 500,000 for those shares when they were issued. Now, we also know that there were common shares issued during the year on September 30th, 2000X6. So this is going to affect your basic EPS calculation, Part B, right? Now in C, we're giving you what their earnings were for the year, so you can calculate your basic EPS. And now we're giving you some information about, about the bonds. We know they're 8%, so they pay interest at 8% a year. They're convertible. And what we see here is that the million dollars that is the par or the face value but what they are doing is they're telling you that they're sold in denominations of a thousand dollar face value so you have a million dollars in bonds and they're sold in denominations of a thousand dollars right so you have one thousand one thousand bond one thousand dollar bonds and that's how you get your million eh? now it says the interest is payable okay semi-annually june 30th and december 31st and again they tell you now here each thousand dollar bond is convertible into 65 common shares all right and we've already determined we said that if we've got a million in bonds and the, we have uh, denominations of $1,000, then that means we have a 1,000 bonds, right? And each of those 1,000 bonds is convertible into 65 common shares. Now, it says here that we also have options uh, for 50,000 common shares, and the exercise price is $5 a share, and during the year, the average uh, market price during the period, oh, a little typo there, I'll fix that, during the period was $20. Okay, so now what we want to do is use the tax rate and calculate a basic and diluted EPS using the cascade worksheet. And don't forget, we use the cascade worksheet because we present the diluted EPS as a cascade of adjustments from the basic. And don't forget, we always list our securities in the diluted EPS calculation as most dilutive, which means it has the smallest EPS impact. Um, to least dilutive, right? Which has the biggest EPS impact. So now let's begin. So now, first thing we're going to do, there's three steps. 
first step is to calculate your basic EPS. All right. So we set up the cascade worksheet here with the appropriate columns. And now to calculate our basic EPS, we want to see what earnings are available to common shareholders. Well, the question told you there were 2.5 million in earnings, right? Uh, that was right here, part C. We also know that the preferred shares paid a $5 per share dividend, right? And here, um, we're told the number of shares, and here's the dividend, right? Now, don't forget, these preferred shares are cumulative. So whether the dividend is declared or not, when we're calculating our basic EPS, we need to deduct it, right? So now, we're going to go in here and deduct that preferred share dividend to get 2.25 million available to common. Now let's have a look at calculating our wax so that we can get to the basic EPS. So now what did we know? We know that at the beginning of the year we had 450,000 common shares outstanding but don't forget on September the 30th another 100,000 were issued. So that tells me that for the first nine months of the year from January to the end of September we had 450,000 shares out there. Then after September 30th, we had 550,000 out there, 100,000 that we just issued plus the 450 we already had. So now this nine months means we had 450,000 shares outstanding from January to the end of September and from October to the end of December we had the 550,000 outstanding. That gives us a wax of 475,000 common shares. So dollars per share gives us $4.74 a share. That's your basic EPS. Now before we continue on and complete this cascade worksheet, what we need to do is figure out in step two which of the securities, the prefer, uh, the um, the options or the bonds, okay, are dilutive. Now we know that the options, as long as they're in the money, they are dilutive. So now we know from our previous video that whenever we're looking at the EPS impact on options, it will always be zero in the numerator because issuing issuing or converting or exercising options, I should say, to issue shares has no effect on income and has no effect on preferred shares. So the change in the numerator will always be zero. But what we do have to figure out is if the options are in the money, they're dilutive, and then we're going to have to see how many extra shares we're going to have to issue under the Treasury stock model. But we know they're dilutive. Why? Because it says here the exercise buck price is 5 bucks, and the market price throughout the year was $20 on average. So therefore, the options are in the money at the time we're doing the basic EPS or the diluted EPS calculation. So therefore, it's likely that if they had decided, they could have exercised them. So therefore, we know that we are going to have to issue 50,000 common shares or sorry, we shouldn't say we're going to have to issue under the what if scenario because there are no actual conversions, right? If these guys had exercised their options, and they could have because it, it would have made sense if they did, even though they didn't, they could have because they're in the money, right? So the idea is if they had, we would have issued 50,000 common shares. And what would have happened? Those guys would have given us $5 per share to get those 50,000 shares. So we would have got $250,000 gone into the marketplace in order to fulfill the exercised options to get the shares. And we would have taken that 250000 and bought back shares or repurchased shares for $20 a share. So that means we're going to have to issue some additional shares 
to get them these 50,000. So now under the treasury share method, what we would do in this step is even though we know the options are dilutive, we still want to calculate the number of extra shares we're going to have to issue over and above the ones that we can buy back from the marketplace. So we know we're going to have to issue an additional 37,500 shares. All right. So now, 0 divided by 37,500 new shares is still going to be 0. It's the most dilutive, so therefore it's going to go first in step 3 when we do the diluted EPS calculation. So again, you might want to go back to the first video where we talked about options and look at this because this is the treasury stock method. And don't forget under the treasury stock method, if the options are dilutive, we must do a calculation that we put in our diluted EPS cascade worksheet that compares the number of shares we would have issued if these guys had exercised their options and compare it to the number of shares we would have been able to buy back in the marketplace at that market price with the proceeds from the investors in order to fulfill this 50,000. We would have only been able to buy back 12,500, which means we now got to issue an additional 37,500 shares. So that would increase your wax rate right, by 37,500. So that's one. The next thing you got to do is now you got to check the bonds. So now how do we deal with bonds? Well, now we have to think, had these guys converted the bonds into shares, we would not have expensed any interest. So we would have had, just to be clear, interest expense avoided right and then what would have happened if those share bonds had been converted to shares there would have been more shares issued right so therefore when we're trying to calculate the change in our EPS we are going to have an effect on net income not preferred shares but we are going to have an effect on net income why because we use interest expense to help us calculate net income right and the other thing is net income is calculated on an after-tax basis so now we're going to calculate the interest expense avoided after tax, right? A slash tax to me is my short form for after tax. So now we have to calculate how much interest expense we would have avoided had we converted these bonds into shares. We wouldn't have had any bond interest expense pre net income or pre-tax so therefore after tax because we're adjusting net income again earnings available to our common shareholders right that's after tax we have to calculate the amount of interest expense we would have avoided on an after tax basis so how do we calculate it well in this question they haven't given you the market rate and don't forget when you're dealing with bonds interest expense is calculated based on the market rate we're assuming here that the market rate and the um, coupon rate are the same because they haven't told us any different in this question so therefore we're going to take our million dollars in bonds, multiply it by our market, which is the same as our coupon rate. All right. And then what we're going to do is that calculate that at 80,000. And then we're going to apply an after tax rate of 60%. 1 minus 0.4 is 0.6. So don't forget 0.4 or 40% is your tax rate. So after tax, our net income would have increased by 60% of the interest expense, right? And that's 48,000. Now, how many new shares would have been issued to adjust your denominator? Well, don't forget, they told you in the question here, if you go back, it said that each $1,000 bond is convertible into 65 common shares. We discussed that for a million dollars in bonds, if they're being issued in denominations of $1,000, you have a 1,000 bonds, and each bond is convertible into 65 shares. So therefore, you would have had an additional 65,000 common shares had these guys converted those bonds to shares. Now you've got a change in your EPS of point of 74 cents, and this is how we get it. So now you can see that this option, which has an EPS impact of zero, 
and this bond, which has an EPS impact of $0.74, cents, both are significantly less than your basic EPS, right? So I'm going to include them both in my calculation of diluted EPS. Okay, so now let's go back. I'm just repeating this in our opening line of step three, right? For your diluted EPS calculation, it might actually help you guys if I repeated some of these titles here. They might be slightly askew, but I'm going to do it so you can follow in case you're finding it a little challenging. Actually, maybe I should just do it like this. Yeah, that's not bad. There. Actually, do one step down. So now we got we got a um, basic EPS which we just took from here, right? What we did before up here, all right. And now we're going to um, in the diluted piece, we're going to look at the impact of the options. I'll just put diluted EPS in here, right? Look at the diluted EPS. The options are going first because they're the most dilutive. We discussed that it doesn't have an impact on your earnings available to common, but we were going to have to issue an additional, on this line here, an additional 37,500 shares, such that when we add it to the wax that we started with, in total we're going to have an extra 512,500 shares. So now we're going to get a diluted EPS at this point of 439 a share, which is less than 474, which is what we want. So notice that every stage here we're subtotaling. Okay. Now let's look at the bonds. The bonds, when we look at that calculation, the amount of after-tax interest expense we avoided was 48000 So that meant we had more earnings available to common to the tune of 48000 And we, we would have issued an extra 65,000 shares. So therefore, our bottom line here is that the earnings that would have been available to common shareholders had these conversions and exercise of options took place would have been 2298000 We would have had 577,500 shares outstanding. So your diluted earnings per share is going to be $3.98. So now, this concludes the presentation of calculating diluted EPS for bonds and options where there are no conversions during the period.